We are studying the book of Daniel. Uh, last week, we were in the fifth chapter. There are 12 chapters in the book. And as we studied the book of Daniel last week, we learned a story about the Babylonian king named Belshazzar. He had a brief stint in the Bible. And it was a really odd story where he was celebrating and worshiping himself, not unlike a lot of kings do to this day. Amen. There was a hand writing on the wall. And in the story, Daniel yet again was called upon to explain what was written. And he was able to. And later that night, Belshazzar, the king, was killed when the Persian kingdom overtook Babylon. Daniel was spared, and it doesn't talk about that portion, but he was. So now we have this new king over the entire region named Darius. And this brings us to our sixth chapter today, and we find ourselves at the front porch of one of the most well-known stories on all of the Bible, Daniel and the lion's den. We've heard the story in Sunday school class, right? We've, we've heard this analogy and analysis of the story over many years. But that can present some difficulties when we know a story this well. You see, it is very dangerous when we know a story so very good because we have a tendency to sometimes want to insert ourselves as the main character in a story. That is not the purpose of the book of Daniel. The book is not about us. The book is for us. It's about Daniel here. It's about Daniel because we can't draw an allegorical conclusion to how we might fit into Daniel's scenario. We don't know what it would have been like to be him. We don't know what it would have been like to be cast in the den of lions, but knowing that there's something greater. It wasn't about him. It was about God and his faith into God. What we find is that it's about Daniel and that he was faithful to Jehovah God. There's much more work in this passage than this, so I don't want to go to a knee-jerk reaction. I want to extract what the Word of God says this morning. We must learn what God hath done. If you have your Bibles with you, would you please turn to Daniel chapter 6. If you don't, we'll put the words on the screen behind me. I'm going to ask our Scripture reader to come forward, please, and he will read Daniel 6, 1 through 15. Daniel 6, 1 through 15. It pleased Darius to set over them 120 satraps, be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel came distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. No error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered 
said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed, and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for bringing us all together today to worship you. We ask that we would humble ourselves before your throne of mercy and ask that you would open our ears to hear your word today, to go before us, Lord God, and just write your words upon our hearts. Strengthen us as we go out into this world, whatever we may face. Lord God, I pray that I do not get in the way of your message going forward this morning, that you would remove me and speak by way of your spirit through me, an unworthy vessel to your children, all for your glory, Jesus. And it's in your precious, holy, and most perfect name we pray these things. Amen. Daniel is honestly one of the greatest servants of the Bible, um, I think. He served God so wholeheartedly, and his story stands as a picture of really what faithfulness looks like. You know, it, it really, it's, it's amazing to see how someone could trust the Lord so much as he did. Think about this. We always read the Word of God or any story of history with hindsight, right? You, you can read now, like for instance, you might D-Day, right? We know how horrific D-Day was when we landed on the, the beachhead and, and how many men died. Well, we know that we succeeded in World War II. So, right, we watch, we look at that, but think about the men who were on that ship. They did not know what their outcome would be. Likewise, I think a lot of times that we, we forget that Daniel had a trust in God, but he didn't have a foresight of what God was gonna do. He knew that he loved God and he was gonna be faithful to God and he was not gonna stop praying to Jehovah God just because there is a little decree out there, an ordinance, an injunction about stopping to praying to anybody but a king. He's not praying to a king. He's praying to God. He's not gonna bow down and, 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 and curl up and do something that's outside of what he can do. That's what's made him a man of integrity. Think about this. In our story, we find that King Darius puts him and two others as the three lead governing officials over 120 satraps. Not a word we use a lot today, but let's, let's, let's call them like mayors, okay? And the three officials are like governors. And, and Darius is looking to have one person, a prime minister, overseer, like a president over all of them. And he's looking at setting Daniel. This is crazy. A man who is neither Persian nor Babylonian. He's a Jew. He's a Jew that is not kingly. He's not royalty. He's not a priest. He's not a missionary. He's not a pastor. Anything. He's not a... He is literally, at first, an exiled slave brought over as a smart, attractive young man, well, along with Mishael, right, Hananiah, Azariah, to learn the ways of Babylon to become Babylonians. That's why they had the names Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are their, those are their Babylonian false god names. We know those better. How about those original four names? Those are their God-given names as members of the nation of Israel. And as they're given these names, they're also remembering that they're not going, they'll learn the ways, they'll learn the culture, they'll speak your language, they'll write your, your hieroglyphics, right? What we're not gonna do is we're not gonna partake in serving the false God. That's what got them into the fiery furnace, Amen. That's what lands him now into a real pickle. He's going to go to the lion's den because of this. Wash away the ragweed. He's an exiled slave. The difference about Daniel here is that he honors God. And the word of God says about him, because of an, an excellent spirit was in him. Did you happen to catch that? 
because an excellent spirit was in him. Now we know it wasn't until Christ ascended and the helper, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descended to take up residence in those of us who in the New Testament church, in the new covenant, repent and believe and are baptized by the spirit of God. But that does not remove the Holy Spirit from doing the work that he did prior to Christ ascending. We know this because in the book of Genesis, when, when God was creating the world in six literal days, that when he was creating it, the Holy Spirit of God hovered over the primordial waters. It went before it was doing the work. So we know that Daniel has an excellent spirit about him. This should shed light today on what we're supposed to be like as Christians. Christian. We are, to, we are to shine because that is what God has given to us by his spirit and dwelling. We are to shine for him. That's why it's, Jesus says be salt and light. We are to remain salty because we are to partake in our faith walk. Otherwise, we're no good to him. And we're a bright shining light because who else is going to do it for him? Nobody but you and I. Nobody but you and I. By the grace of God, through his spirit, that's what we do. Okay. We're paying attention to scripture. We got to open our eyes to the fact that those who serve the Lord God are different. We're called to be a peculiar people. Peculiar people is what the Lord says. It's a really strange word. Amen? But we're all peculiar. <laughs> Some of us more than others. Wasn't talking about the immediate, overnight, nor sudden, complete change of character occurs here. We got to remember, as Ricardo was talking about in, in, the, in the communion meditation, we're to be kind and gentle, progressively showing better self control, love, and peace. We're to be forgiving and patient. Well, that word forbearance means we have to learn patience, we get better at it. And the big one that we always forget, and I especially always forget, is the word goodness. What does goodness mean when you're talking about the nine fruit of the Spirit? Goodness is a, actually legitimately means a progressive transformation by the Holy Spirit of God. So the fruit of the Spirit is all based on a progressive transformation. Just because you got saved doesn't mean you can flip the light switch off on your old past. You're still in a body of flesh which is going to, uh, really, it's going to haunt you the rest of your life because the Word of God tells us that the flesh is hostile to God. Hostile to God. Now, you're different. You're way different. You're redeemed. The Spirit of God has taken up residence in you. He has saved you. He's redeemed you to Him. But it, your change from yesterday to the day you die is this progressive sanctification. Come on. How many of you know you can do a little bit better on being patient? Especially you, Mike. No. Um, <laughs> yes, yesterday, uh, we ran to, to uh, turn something in at a store in Lawrence. And so Shelly and I went out, and we went right next door, Papa Kino's. They moved downtown on Mass Street in Lawrence. And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Got a slice of pie. They've already pre-cooked the pizza. All they do is that they put the toppings on it and put it in the oven to rewarm it and heat it and bring it to a crisp. It took 39 minutes. 39. 39 minutes. <laughs> and I did. I got, I finally, I was nice, but I was like, walked in, I was like, how long does it take to get two slices of pizza? So they're like, it's coming right now, and it was. But this, this is something, I was nice to them, but as a joke, but seriously, this is what we've got to learn, amen? And it's not patience about our pizza. It's patience with humanity. It's patience with ourselves, with our children. It's patience in knowing that, and you're in a spot in your life that the world is working against you. You've got to be patient with the Lord and wait on him. So when we learn these things and we continue to move through the book of Daniel, I want to show you this. I think when we look at Daniel, we can say, first of all, it would be really nice to be a lot more like Daniel. 
Somebody who just had that faith in God, he wasn't going to fail, he was going to be fine. And even if he got thrown into the lion's den and, and savagely tore up, he still was going to die for his Savior, for his God. He was never going to turn his back on his God. And we know how it turned out, but again, he didn't know how it was going to turn out. He had faith. But in order for us to understand, if we want to be more faithful like a man like Daniel, we got to go to Jeremiah 29. Now, Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of those verses that I once heard a pastor perfectly state. He said, quote, we know and love this verse so much because we rip it kicking and screaming out of its context, and then we bludgeon it to death until it says something it was never intended to say. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now that in itself is a wonderful verse. Amen? Okay, but, but we'll take that and we go, I know that he's got a plan. Well, just time out. What, did it originally, what was it originally meant for? So I want you to please read with me what it originally meant. We're going to go to Jeremiah 29. I'll um, put the words up here. We're going to do verse 1 first. Listen to this. Jeremiah the prophet, by the way, has written this letter to, Dan- to Daniel. These are captives in Babylon under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. So he says, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So among these exiles are Daniel, Michelle, Azariah, Hananiah. Amen? Okay, this is what Jeremiah says next. He is speaking on behalf of God as a prophet to them. Listen and look at the quote marks on this. Thus says the Lord in verse 4, the God of Israel to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. I have sent. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and have daughters and, and, and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Amen? For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Ouch! Ouch! Those of us who have spent our time sometimes looking to see what kind of prophecy somebody's got on YouTube for us today. What'd he say? Let's back up. (laughs) Let's jump back in this. 10 through 14. Let's see what God hath said. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me, and when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, for I, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. It's so beautiful. You know, and you wonder, well, why did God send them into exile? Man, because they're hard-headed. So are we. You know, we got to remember this, that, that, that it is not saints... When you, when you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, it has never been about you. Your life is about him. It's for his glory, his honor, his purpose. I, yeah, I finally got to the point where I said, Lord, you, you have it. Because I fail you. I fail in this life. I needed him to take it over. Some of you have done that too, and some of you might do that. And I pray that all of you sometime do that. 
But at some point, we got to realize that when we're reading the scripture, Jeremiah said, listen to what God has said. God says, I pulled you out of there. I sent you into exile. Make a life there. Have houses and families and plant gardens and work. When 70 years are over, I'll listen to your heart cry. It is through this trust now, as we resume our story in Jan- Daniel, that he is sought after by the Persian king to rule over the, all the land for him. Uh, this is what's beautiful. The godless people don't like it. Godless people don't like you and I, amen? When they know there's something different about you, that's why you gotta be a peculiar people because they know they can see something about you that's different. That's right. You shine like a light. When you shine like a light, people are gonna be attracted to it and the enemy's gonna hate you for it. Because you're made in the image of God's holy son. Amen? Amen. Now, this is something here. Listen to what happens in 16 through 18 of Daniel 6. We'll pick back up there. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast in the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and sleep fled from him. (laughs) Time out. The king of Persia, who just overtook one of the greatest empires in the history of the world in Babylon, can't sleep and can't eat, but he's honoring his own decree with Daniel, but it wrenches his gut that he's doing this to a man of God. And listen to what he says. May your God, Daniel, whom you serve continually deliver you. What an endorsement. Praise God. (laughs) He goes back and he can't sleep, and he's fasting, and he says no diversions were brought to him. In other words, leave me alone. My friend is in the den. Daniel 19, verse 19 and 6. Then at daybreak, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. He scurried. He couldn't run fast enough. As he came near to the the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And, amen. Then Daniel said to the king, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm, end quote. The king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found in him because he had trusted in his God. Now watch this. And the king commanded that those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast in the den of lions, they, their children and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. He went from excited that his friend was safe and fine and a bite on his body to turning and going, get in there. It's brutal. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, listen to this. Technically, King Darius is now the man. Leader of the free world, y'all. Amen? Amen. He conquered Babylon, which Nebuchadnezzar was. Okay, here we go. So then Darius, King Darius wrote to all the peoples in verse 25, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel 
prospered during the king, the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. What a beautiful story. All right, so as I work to the close here, it's about 10 minutes, okay? I got four points I want to share with you, and I want you to pay attention to these, please, please. Number one, God has our enemies under control. This is something for us to extract from this. We might often feel as if truly evil people in the world never get punished, that they get theirs and we're the ones left, we're the unlucky ones, they're the lucky ones. You ever felt that way? Well, you're not alone. I, I, I pray you hear me this morning. The birth and the growth of these frustrations that you may have with that, that find the way to the forefront of a Christian mind, only stems from your flesh and its jealousy of humanity. You belong to God. Why are you jealous of man? Let me try that again. You belong to God. Why are you jealous of man? Must have been a lot of ouches going on inside your hearts for nobody to be amen to me this morning on that one. So let me just take this one up a notch. Because I'm going to tell you, you're not going to find peace and contentment, everyone, in pornography, in scratch tickets, in your lottery, or your casino time, or wasting your money on stuff that's not, and heaven forbid you spend your money on necromancing, tarot cards and things like that, which God despises. You have to trust in the Lord, and if you're not reading the scripture, you're not gonna get fed. How do you think that you can overcome this progressive sanctification doesn't just come because you hop in church on Sunday and you brought a pie to the last fellowship supper. Thank you for doing it, but don't be, don't be doing this, amen? That's not earning points in heaven. He wants you to commune with him. This is what Carter was talking about. That's why we do the Lord's Supper. We need to remember that body that was torn and beaten and scourged and scoffed and laughed at and spit on, and then he had to carry his own cross up Calvary Hill to die a wretched sinner's death when he was blameless, but he took it for you and I. And after he was dead and buried, he rolled that stone away and defeated death and conquered it on the third day. Help you that you serve in mankind. Your mankind don't do that for you. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And he's coming back. And we've got to be ready, church. We've got to pull together as the worldwide church. Yeah, there's going to be churches that do not follow true biblical Christianity. But that doesn't mean you can't love people. That doesn't mean you can't love your neighbor. In fact, the only way that they're going to get corrected is if you help them. It's not the Word of God plus the Book of Mormon. It's not the Word of God plus something else. It's the Word of God. It's sufficient. It's correct. It's inerrant. And it's enough. You think about God having our enemies under control. Listen to this, Revelation 21.8. That is for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, As for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Wait wait a minute, what's the first death? Human life. Everybody dies. But you're born twice, you die once. Come on. You're born to your mama. You're born again. You die once. You were with the Heavenly Father. You're with your Lord and Savior the rest of time. You're born one time, you die twice. You have an earthly death and you have another death upon the great wide throat judgment, which is the last day. When he returns to judge all, you are marked safe, but you've got to follow your Savior. Do not think that just because you walked up to the pulpit one day at the front of the church and you stamped that passport of yours, I'm good, I'm saved, right? Right? Carter was talking about that. I'm baptized. We meet people all the time. I'm good. I've been baptized. I done did that, Pastor. You done did what? 
What exactly do you think you did? Because he says that you are to follow him. You are to love him with your whole heart, mind, soul, strength. Secondly, it's equally as important to love your neighbor as yourself. This does not happen just because you got up and rode a bike to work. you got to put in the effort. And it's effort. But it's the best effort you've ever done. It's the greatest reward you'll ever have. When Jesus says in Matthew 25, 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous in eternal life, he's got you and I. He's got you and I. You belong to the God who created everything. You are not a chump. Amen? Amen. God first, then state. I'll make these last three points. Daniel did not try to hide from his faith, but he put God first. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. He was not concerned, but he was not going to bow down to any government telling him that he couldn't worship the Lord. There's a mic drop on God in that one there. God is faithful to his people. Number three. We often forget we're a royal priesthood. Now listen to this. 1 Peter 2.9. For you a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of his darkness into his marvelous light. Amen? No matter what happens, God's in control. God is always in control. Number four, and finally, trust in the one who is faithful to us. You know, Daniel prayed to God. He was not instigating confrontation. He wasn't trying to get in trouble. He wasn't trying to go dive into a den of lions. You're not going to stop me from worshiping and praying to my God. I serve God and God alone. And today, we serve Christ and Christ alone. God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Son. We serve a triune God. One God, three persons. Co-equal, co-eternal. We serve the God of all creation. The one who redeemed us to live in him. You know, I want to read you something. I told you, I, this isn't, uh, I thought this was well done. There was a band years ago, and they had a song. It's called Lion's Den. The group was called Guardian. And the bridge said this. Have you all ever had a fever dream? Okay, let me, let me try that again. When, when was the last time you had a fever? Amen? Your thoughts go goofy. I thought I saw the Michelin man the last time I had it. I'm not even kidding. I, I'm not even joking. I saw the Michelin man in my living room. I was on the couch. I never told you guys about that. But he just come walking through the living room, and I was like, I know I got a fever when I see the Michelin man. I'm serious. Come on. So let's just leave that there. This old segue. Late one night in a fever dream, the prophet Daniel appeared to me. Sir, I said, I've lost my nerve. I lip serve God and put my faith in godless men. Oh, I fear the lion's den. Then Daniel said, who says I'm not a feline phobe? Who says I wasn't ready to wet my robe? Faith is tough, boy, but God gives grace. Take a deep breath, head up, set your face like flint. Oh, and stop being a wimp. They took liberty with that. But amen. There is no one greater than our Savior. You belong to him. So stop being a wimp. Stay strong in the word. Stay strong in prayer. Stay strong with him. Grow. Pray that he, you know, the word says if you draw near to God, he draws near to you. That's not something he just says. He promises that to you and I. Amen. I love him because he loved me first. Amen. All right, let's pray this morning. 
Lord God, we thank you. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, Lord God, for redeeming us to live in you. For anybody today, Lord God, that has never truly repented and believed in you, today is the day of salvation. We do not know what happens tomorrow. We do not know what comes tomorrow. We don't even know if we got tomorrow. We don't know if we got the rest of the day. But today is the day. Lord Jesus, and we just lift our hands to you and we praise you and we pray for our friends that don't know you and our family that don't know you and and, and those, Lord Jesus, who, who have detested you. We pray that you would soften their stone hearts and break them down and soften them and allow them to fall in love with you, Lord God, the way we have. May we draw near to you and you draw near to us and we humble ourselves in service unto you every single day, the rest of our lives. May we be bright, bold, shining witness for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for Madison this morning. It's so wonderful to see a young person who says, yeah, I want to show everybody that something's happened on the inside of me. Praise you, God, for that. In your precious holy name, we give you the glory, Lord Jesus, and all God's people said, amen.